Hey, good evening, everyone. Welcome to another session of Virtual Global Spawn Conference. So I'm really excited to be here again. As you know, I'm one of the panelists um, for Virtual Spine, and we'll be speaking tonight about cervical spine deformity. So if there's anyone that wants to pitch in or chime in, we could have an open discussion about some cases, and uh, we shall get started. So um, I have no relevant disclosures for this talk other than the fact that I'm a surgical consultant for Medtronic and you'll see some of their hardware, some of the operative videos I show. So I think uh, we have to give some credit to, actually, we have to give a lot of credit to Chris Ames and Hanjo Kim. They've really put together this beautiful cervical spine deformity classification system. And uh, we also have to give a lot of credit to Virginie Lafage as well. Uh, she put together this, this wonderful piece of work a number of years ago that really helped us to define what normal cervical lordosis is. And I can say as, as a attending surgeon now, one of my biggest pet peeves is when I read these radiology reports that state that a patient has lost cervical lordosis. Now, a lot of younger patients actually do not have cervical lordosis yet. What happens is that as we continue to age, thoracic kyphosis will increase, and then we have a commensurate amount of cervical lordosis. So this, this paper actually proves the opposite is what we're all taught, is that the younger we are, the less lordosis we have in our neck, but the older we are, the more lordosis we have as a result of the hyperthoracic kyphosis. And this is a great diagram from Chris Ames and the UCSF crew that showed this quite nicely, that as we continue to age, the T1 slope will continue to increase. But to compensate for that, we need to kick our heads back and increase our cervical lordosis. And really, from a quality of life perspective, it's important that we are able to keep our head extension in about five degrees and flexion in about 18 degrees or so. And within that range, most patients have a relatively low disability. This is a cervical deformity classification uh, descriptor that was put together by Chris Ames a number of years ago. And we'll do our best to hit on all these different types tonight. These are the different types of parameters that I use to measure uh, when I am encountered with a cervical deformity case. So when these patients arrive in our clinic, the first thing outside of the neurological assessment that we do in these patients and the history taking is that I do like to get a neutral upright x-ray on them. I always get a scoliosis x-ray, skull to femoral heads on every one of these patients. It's important to see what their neutral alignment looks like. It's equally important to see what their type of extension reserve is. And this can give you some insight into how extensive of an operation the patient may need. We're all very familiar with what PI minus LL is, the PI LL mismatch. And there's a commensurate type of formula for T1 slope and cervical lordosis. As the T1 slope increases, we need to kick back our head and have a commensurate amount of cervical lordosis to achieve and maintain upright erect posture. And there's actually a mathematical formula <clears throat> that goes along with that as well. So why don't we break down into some cases? We'll talk about the different types of cervical spine deformity. There's really six main types, in my opinion, outside of the congenital deformity, which is really uh, confined more to the pediatric population. And these all range from uh, very flexible to somewhat flexible to rigid. If it's flexible, it's obviously a very easy day in the operating room for most of us. You don't require any osteotomies to get patients corrected. We essentially just reposition them either in traction or the Mayfield head holder. And a lot of times we can get a very nice uh, clinical and radiographic result. If they're rigid, this is when we need to utilize the AIM cervical osteotomy classification. So we'll start off by talking briefly about post-traumatic deformity. This is probably the most common that we all see. A lot of these deformities are not necessarily long-standing because the majority of us, especially if we work at a level one trauma center like I do, uh, these traumatic deformities will come in and we typically will treat these patients immediately. We're not usually letting them heal in the kyphotic fashion. This was a young gentleman I took care of a few years ago who had a snowmobile accident while he was intoxicated, came in with an Asia A spinal cord injury, as we can see, profound spinal cord compression, and we took him for a front and back operation. This is a very straightforward type of a traumatic deformity that we take care of. There's really nothing too fancy about a case like this. Here's our before, here's our after. We performed a two-level vertebral column resection, and then we decompressed him from the back as well, C2 down to about T3 uh, decompression infusion. 
Now, it is important, even if a patient has an Asia A spinal cord injury, that we still treat their residual deformity. There's a fair amount of literature that really supports taking patients out of kyphosis, despite the fact that they may have a complete injury, and decompressing their spinal canal as well. This was a patient that took care of a few years ago who had previously had a upper thoracic spinal cord injury. It doesn't look all that impressive, but it unfortunately healed in a bit of kyphosis here. And what happened was that she subsequently developed severe spinal cord tethering, and she needed to undergo a, a spinal cord arachnolytic operation. And we can see this is what her syringomyelia looked like before we detethered her cord. And this was actually what her MRI looked like the next day, believe it or not. This is hard to believe that we were able to achieve such a profound a decrease in her syringomyelia, but we were able to just by decompressing the T3, T4 level and performing arachnolysis. Sometimes we're dealt with rotational spine fractures such as this. This is a somewhat unusual fracture. I, I can probably count on one hand how many times I've seen this type of a fracture. I'm not sure. Are there any of the other panelists that are on tonight? Uh, Alex or Mike, if you're able to pitch in. I'm just curious what people would do for a fracture like this. This was a gentleman in his mid-50s that was in a high-speed motor vehicle collision. He presented to us with uh, he had some myelopathic symptoms, almost looked like a central cord picture, but his head was kind of stuck in this cock robin fashion like this. Anybody in the audience want to maybe put in the chat box what type of a fracture you think this is and, and how you would treat this? I'll show you this scan first. This is what his CAT scan looked like. He previously had an ACDF at C5-C6, and here's his MRI scan showing pretty pronounced spinal cord compression above that at C4-C5. And here's his upright x-rays. Here's his lateral, here's his AP, and we can see that his head is kicked off way to the side here. Any takers, I'll see if I can open up the chat box to see what anybody would do here. All right, if, the, if there's none of the other panelists are on, I'll go on to talk about what I did here, and what type of fracture, the way I would classify this. Uh, this is what we call a vertical C1 split fracture. And we could see that the lateral mass of C1 has essentially been, been split into thirds here. And what's happened is that uh, the lateral mass of C1 has kicked off laterally relative to C2. And obviously this is a gross violation of the rule of spent as we can see. If we look closely at the CT scan here, we could see the rotational deformity that's occurring between C1 and C2. So this was a bit of a tough case for me to figure out exactly uh, what, what the most appropriate approach would be here, because uh, I think this might be a very reasonable case for something called C1 osteosynthesis, where you can place C1 lateral mass screws, place a horizontal bar, uh, perform a compression maneuver. The problem at hand here is that he also had a cock robin deformity if his head on his neck, and additionally had a picture consistent with central cord syndrome. Uh, so this is what he looked like intraoperatively. He was a, a fairly large, obese gentleman, lots of soft tissue in the back of the neck. And we could see he's got a fracture here of the poster arch of C1 as well. And one of the most difficult things in a case like this is placing your C1 lateral maskers because now that entire segment is completely mobile. So what we do here is uh, we'll have our assistant is stabilize this part of the poster arch of C1 as we place our uh, C1 lateral mass screws. And this is what it looked like after surgery. We could see that there's a, a fairly large air gapping between the lateral mass of C1 and C2 within the facet joint here. We're able to get a very reasonable correction. And this is what he looked like on his AP x-rays after surgery. This is him before surgery. And in the sagittal plane, um, these are his post-op x-rays. We ended up taking him from C1 down to about C6. Uh, to fixate him into his previous fusion construct, and he was able to do uh, quite well after this. One of the other type of fractures that we run into a lot that can certainly cause extension deformities are the ankylose spine fractures. One of the interesting things about these fractures is that sometimes they can uh, they they can hide on us a bit. This was the same patient that had the uh, same fracture. Obviously, these are two different CAT scans during the same day. One was a CT, the other was a CTA, and we could see that these can sometimes uh, hide from our visualization. 
This was a more obvious ankylospine fracture that I took care of a few weeks ago. This unfortunate gentleman had been intoxicated, uh, had a fall getting out of his car and came into us with an incomplete spinal cord injury. And he was found to have an epidural hematoma and uh, some left upper extremity weakness. And one of the issues that I tend to run into with these patients is that a lot of them end up having dysphagia. Um, I always thought it was because of what I did to them during surgery that I fixated them in this extension position. But what I've started doing more recently is getting, uh, if it's not an emergency operation, sometimes is, is to get a preoperative quick swallow evaluation on these patients. And I suspect that if we all did this, we would find that a lot of these ankylospine fracture patients end up having preoperative dysphagia because their esophagus is laying over their vertebral column. They have these very large candlestick uh, syndesmophytes here. And it, I, I suspect that it probably causes some type of attraction injury to the esophagus. And this gentleman was no different. He ended up having uh, dysphagia even after we operated on him. And this is what he was able to uh, be corrected as afterwards. Uh, but again, if there's any panelists on, I'm very curious or anyone in the chat box, if anyone wants to chime in about their experience with ankylospine fractures and how you deal with the dysphagia here. All right, so it looks like we've got no panelists logged on at the moment that's able to speak and that's fine, um, but uh, we'll move on to the next case. So let's talk about post-infectious. This was a case I posted on Twitter last evening. Uh, the, the patient, as you'll see, her, her post-op x-rays still have staples in them because I just did this case a couple of weeks or so ago. This was a very fascinating case of uh, a woman in her early 70s who previously has a history of head and neck cancer. And this was treated uh, back in 2020 with one of our ENT surgeons at UNC. They had performed a partial laryngectomy on her. And this is what her next film looked like in 2020. Let's fast forward about two years, and this is what she looks like in 2022. She presented to me just before the holidays with a pretty pronounced chin on chest deformity. She had cervical myelopathy. She was aspirating uh, because of her previous prior partial laryngectomy. She really could not speak very well either, so she had dysphonia as well, and very pronounced dysphagia, aspirating a lot. This is what her preoperative x-rays look like. We could see that she's got a pretty pronounced uh, focal kyphosis. Her T1 slope looks relatively normal. And here's what her CAT scan looks like. And I think the top differential diagnosis in the case like this is that we're either dealing with radionecrosis because she's had previous radiation to her neck, or we're dealing with some type of chronic fistula between her posterior or pharyngeal space and her vertebral column or a combination of the two. So what we can see is that there's this moth-eaten appearance, essentially from C3 all the way down to C6. C5 and C6 appear to be somewhat autofused. And there's also some autofusion posteriorly as well. <clears throat> Here's what her MRI scan looked like. Uh, she did have some static spinal cord compression in the mid subaxial area of the cervical spine but I suspect that most of her myelopathy was essentially from the fact that her spinal cord was completely draped over this hyperkyphotic segment of the spinal cord here. And here's what her 3D reconstruction had looked like prior to surgery as well. From the audience, I'm curious, what would you do at this point? Uh, you guys could feel free to uh, place in the chat box. Let's see. Someone had asked, does this dysphagia resolve over time? Um, in this particular case, after our solution, I can tell you um, that it is currently resolving. Uh, we're nowhere near where we'd like to be right now. Um, I think someone had mentioned occipital fixation. So I, I'll move on to show you um, what, what we did in this situation. So we obviously got our ENT surgeons. Uh, I see Mike Selby. Mike, do you have a comment about this case? Uh, I'm keen on seeing what you did, but yeah, I think ENT is very um, helpful to get uh, you know, through that mess anteriorly. I think it's going to be a, a very good idea to have some help. Right. So I guess one of the questions is, you know, can you address this from an all posterior approach? And I, you certainly can, but I think that if you decompress her posteriorly and you fixate her, there's no impetus for the spinal cord to flow back, right? The spinal, the spinal column is not even straight. She frankly kyphotic here. So even if you decompress her, 
from C2 to T1 or C7, that spinal cord's really not going to float back. So I felt pretty strongly that if we were going to move forward with this operation and this patient that was really properly vetted, most patients are not candidates for, for what we ended up doing for her, uh, that we did have to perform some type of anterior column reconstruction here. So we absolutely got our ENT surgeons on board to assist us with this. Because she had a chronic fistula and was aspirating, uh, our ENT surgeon at UNC felt that she would be uh, a good candidate for a uh, completion laryngectomy. And that this would really give us a, a pretty unparalleled view to what her spine looked like. So I'm just going to kind of go through what my thoughts were for this case. So how we would do this over two stages. Um, we've got to take out everything from C3 down to C6. And then we need to figure out how we're going to reconstruct this, right? So we need to take out C3, C4, C5, and C6. The problem that we have when we go to reconstruct this anteriorly is that if you place a cage at the anterior part of C7, it's going to be proud to C3, I'm sorry, uh, proud to C2, right? If you place your cage posteriorly at C7, it's going to be you know, it may fit well on the anterior part of C2, but this is going to be very close to the spinal canal, which I was not um, very excited about either. So what we decided to do was reorientation of the end plates. And essentially, this means that we take a coarse diamond drill bit and we essentially buff the end plates down and we essentially reposition the end plate of C2 inferiorly and the superior end plate of C7 so that we can eventually place our cage in a very reasonable position. And this was the only time I had ever used this particular cage, and I'll show you during the operative video, but this particular cage has uh, an option for integrated screws as well. And I thought that this was um, a, a very a very nice type of a cage reconstruction for this particular type of a case. So to orient you, a complete laryngectomy has been done. We're looking straight down. Uh, this is her spinal column. Here's her head's over here. Her feet are over here. This is the left side, this is the right side. Uh, this is that moth-eaten vertebral body as we can see. What we're doing now is our discectomy. Now we're doing our corpectomy using the coarse diamond drill bit. We're taking out the lateral part of the vertebral bodies. We've now exposed the dura between C2 and C3, between C6 and C7. And now we've got this long uh, anterior plate of bone that needs to be resected with our kerosens. Once we're able to take all of this out, and decompress the spinal cord. We're now using our coarse diamond drill bit to buff the end plates down, reorient them so that we can place this expandable cage with integrated screw option. Once that cage is settled, we take an x-ray to make sure that it is in fact flush with the end plate above and below. And now here we are placing the integrated screws. And despite the fact that we're able to place four screws into C2 and C7, we still decided to place a plate. Uh, we had ENT harvest a pectoral flap, and then we were able to take her for a posterior uh, a few days later. And this is what the intraoperative O-arm spin looked like once we were able to uh, complete stage two. We ended up taking her up to C1 because I was not uh, thrilled leaving um, the top of the construct at C2. I think we, uh, we set a world record for the amount of screws we have in C2. We actually placed seven screws in C2. We had, I believe, three from the front, or I'm sorry, four from the front and three from the back. And she's about three or four weeks out of surgery now, uh, has been up ambulating out of bed, neurologically doing fantastic. These are some intraoperative photos. This is after the complete laryngectomy is done. This is the view that I had from the front, from the side. Here's our cage. And here's once the plate is in. And then this is what she looked like after surgery, once her pectoral muscle flap uh, was taken and she was uh, all put back together again afterwards. Here's her pre-op x-ray, her post-op x-ray. I usually don't like showing x-rays that still have staples in them because that means we don't have good follow-up, but I thought that this was a unique enough case, despite the fact that we just did this about three or four weeks ago, and, and she's done quite well afterwards. See if anyone has any questions or comments um, about what we did here, or if anyone would do anything differently in a case like this. Hey, Michael, I'm going to jump in. Um, that looks awesome. Just a couple of quick technical things. You know, these patients are super high risk of infection. Um, what do you do to help counter that? You load antibiotic in your bone graft or what are you doing for that? So typically for posterior operations, I, I usually do about two to three grams of ankylomycin powder uh, for all these patients. Um, you know, I, I can say that I probably only had, I think, 
one anterior infection in my entire career and training. I, I, I think because the lymphatics are so good in the neck that most patients still get infected. Obviously, this patient is in a very different box than most patients. So she's at an extraordinarily high risk of an anterior infection. Um, I, I believe our ENT colleagues ended up advocating for keeping her on antibiotics for several weeks to cover oral flora. I mean, you know, if you look at the intraoperative pictures here, uh, you know, th there's definitely, I hate to say that this breaches in sterility, right? But I mean, her neck is filleted open and we see that she's got her, our pseudo trach tube over here, right? She's got half of her face exposed. So, so there, you know, this is not going to be the most sterile operation because obviously, her esophagus was cut. It was reanimated back together. This is the distal under of her esophagus. Um, so, you know, we keep our antibiotics for about a week or two afterwards. And I think we just keep our fingers crossed that, that she doesn't get infected afterwards. Outside of that, I don't know if there's a whole lot more that you could do in this particular type of a situation. This is probably a few times in a career type of a surgery. So time will tell if she gets infected. Obviously, I believe we also left multiple drains in her neck between the front of the neck, the back of the neck. I don't know that there's a whole lot more that we can do in the situation though. And so far she's close to a month out of surgery, no signs of infection. And uh, she, she's done better than all of us could have expected. Yeah. Good, uh, beautiful case, Michael. Um, one quick question from the chat box was how old was the patient? And um, I suppose the other question is on post-op movement um, and how the patient's been going. Yeah, so she's in her early seventies. I believe she's about 72 or 73 years old. Um, post-operatively, you know, we kept her in the intensive care unit for about a, a day or two after the surgery. I believe I, I, sp I did stage one on the Monday. I did stage two on the Wednesday and she was out of the ICU by, I believe Thursday or Friday ended up needing to go back because of some minor respiratory issues, um, to the step down unit. But now she's on the floor, she's up and ambulating. Um, she actually just passed her swallow evaluation, believe it or not. We have a absolute phenomenal head and neck cancer team here at UNC, so they were able to reanastomose her esophagus. Um, you know, she's unfortunately never able to speak again. Uh, she wasn't really able to speak very much before surgery because now she's a completion laryngectomy. Um, but but she's she's done quite well and she's up in ambulatory now. Excellent, Mike. I'm going to ask one really annoying question as well: cervical deformity. And I know we discussed this a bit. T2, T3, T4, T5. Like, do you have a standard N for your construct as a uh, uh, oh, great, great question. Vertebra. Yeah, great question. I've got a, I've got a case of uh, DJK later that I'll talk about a bit. So if a patient has a normal T1 slope, if it's less than 30 degrees, I'm very comfortable stopping at T2 or T3 in those cases. If they have a very high T1 slope, 40, 50, 60 degrees, I'm taking them past the apex of their thoracic kyphosis. We were very fortunate in this case Sorry, we were very fortunate in this case that this uh, lady actually had a normal T1 slope, as we could see yeah. here. It's probably about 15 or 20 degrees. So we were able to get away with stopping at T3 in this case. Uh, but if her T1 slope was a lot higher, she would have had two deformities, uh, focal cervical deformity and a cervical thoracic. In that case, she's probably getting a construct that's taking her down to at least uh, T6, T7, T8. And I'm going to show you a, a case or two of that a bit later, too. Thank you. Yeah. Next case. Um, this was a case I've shown on some different platforms before. Some of you may or may not be familiar, but it, it's a unique enough case uh, that I think it's worth showing over this platform. This was a 14-year-old male that had presented to his pediatrician with mechanical neck pain and he had grip weakness. This is going to be an oncology case. Obviously, focal deformity that we can see here also has a normal T1 slope. He was referred to pediatric neurosurgeon, but unfortunately in the interim period, he sustained a fall at school and uh, presented to the trauma bay. This was a case I had done back in Syracuse, New York, a couple of years or so ago. And a couple of you know, very unique findings. We see that there's uh, lytic destruction from C4 through C6. We can also see that the posterior elements are essentially missing here. It's not just that they're lytic, they just don't seem to exist at a few of these levels. So we were able to take an MRI very quickly, and we can appreciate that he has uh, an unusual enhancement pattern here between C4 and C6, both anterior, anteriorly, posteriorly. Um, so this is a tough case, right? He's 14. He presents to us with an Asia A spinal cord injury after he'd had a fall in school. Um, the CAT scan doesn't look a whole lot different than the pre-fall x-ray that he had had. 
The golden rule of spinal oncology is to biopsy, right? We want to know what we're treating. And unfortunately, I think we all felt pretty strongly in the situation that we didn't really have the, you know, the luxury of time on our side here. So we didn't really have time to biopsy. So we felt that we needed to treat this like a trauma operation, although we felt pretty strong that there was some type of intrinsic oncologic process that was occurring here. So you have to think about the timing, the approach, are you going anteriorly, posteriorly, are we putting him in traction? And if you do decide to go anterior, how many levels are you taking, right? Are we really going to take out three vertebrae in a 14-year-old boy? Uh, I'll show you what we did here. We ended up taking him for a pretty similar approach to that last patient, minus the laryngectomy. Um, here's the anterior approach. We have a pin in C3, a pin in C7 here. And uh, just to orient you, this is the head, this is the feet here. And what we're doing now is we're performing the polar discectomies. First at C3, C4, we're drilling through the disc. We're then getting underneath the posterior longitudinal ligament. I'd like to expose the dura at the polar ends. After we do that, we take a four millimeter rough diamond drill bit. This causes really no bleeding when you drill, as you can see. And we drill longitudinal troughs up and down along the vertebral bodies from C4 through C6. This is now the posterior longitudinal ligament. And as we're biting this down, we can see that there's all sorts of epidural surprises for us that we need to cauterize. Once we're able to uh, get the bleeding under control, we can now kind of march up and down and deliver uh, C4 through C6 as a uh, essentially kind of a reverse lobster tail, right? This is usually how I do my posterior laminectomies. Instead, we're doing an anterior vertebrectomy, C4 through C6 in a lobster tail fashion. And we're able to take our curettes, disconnect this from the remaining annulus above and below. And then we ended up using one of these carjack expandable cages here. In retrospect, I may have done this case uh, if I did this case today, maybe with a fibular strut because he's a, he's a young fella. And uh, I really don't think that patients fuse particularly well through these. They're good for reconstructing the spine. And I don't think he's going to run into any issues, uh, but I'm not completely convinced that patients are through these through the lumen of those cages. The poster part of this operation, we did the same day because it was an emergency operation. So you can appreciate there's really no poster elements here. So uh, it was very difficult to find, uh, you know, docking zones for posterior screws here. So we did one of these very unusual, wacky looking constructs where we ended up placing four screws into C2. And then we placed uh, what lateral mass screws we could, I believe, at C4 and C5 at two different levels. You may be asking, why did we place four screws at C2? Uh, well, we wanted to try to spare him fixation up to C1 or the occiput. So this is really akin to placing bilateral pelvic screws for thoracolumbar deformity. And uh, we kind of coined the term as C2 quad screws here. The diagnosis for this case ended up coming back as uh, hemangioma. Okay, I put neuroaggressive here. Obviously, the pathologist doesn't say these are neuroaggressive. Uh, this is a coined term uh, that kind of first came out of uh, Brigham and Women's with Dr. Groff. And uh, something else that's kind of interesting about this case when we brought this up to our radiologists after surgery was that they actually felt that this could be a case of vanishing bone disease or Gorham Stout syndrome. And as many of you know, the histopathology that's consistent with vanishing bone disease is that these patients will develop these hemangiomatous features of bone. So I thought that this was very interesting till this day. I don't know whether or not this patient truly had a hemangioma or vanishing bone disease, um, but nevertheless, he's about two years out of, of surgery now. Um, as far as how he did from his spinal cord injury, he was able to regain some function uh, of the distal upper extremities, but unfortunately uh, has remained a paraplegic since then. Just going to check the chat box real quick to see um, if there was a pathology. I think uh, someone had mentioned about pathology. I'm assuming that's about the last case. It ended up being infection, the last case. Um, it ended up growing out some oral bacteria and then about frozen section, um, if that's about this case, it's ended up being a hemangioma. So let's move on to iatrogenic deformity. This is probably the most common type of a deformity that uh, that I see in my practice currently at UNC and previously in New York. Uh, this is kind of a run-of-the-mill case where a patient had come in to uh, one of my previous partners with cervical myelopathy. She had a, a pretty high T, uh, C2 slope of about 60 degrees. Unfortunately, the construct was not taken up to C2. 
So we ended up taking her up. This was kind of a, I guess, a, a some variant or iteration of PJK, if you will. This was an interesting case that was presented to me a few years or so ago. This was a patient that initially had presented with cervical myelopathy. A uh, previous surgeon in town in New York had performed a three-level laminal, a four-level laminoplasty, excuse me. Uh, interesting topic, worth some discussion at some point. Um, you know, there's 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 some consideration that needs to be taken when we perform laminoplasties. When I was a resident and a fellow, everyone always taught us, as long as the patient has good cervical lordosis, just like what this patient has, they're a perfect candidate for a laminoplasty. I think that that's, uh, I think that there's there's some red flags with that statement there. I don't think it has as much to do with their cervical lordosis as, um, as it does with their T1 slope. Because what happens in some of these older patients that we perform laminoplasties on, many of them have very poor cervical extensor musculature reserve. So what happens is that is we're, is we're doing our dissection, we're buggering up their posterior ligamentous complex, taking some of their muscular attachments down. They don't have that extension reserve. And some of these patients will end up going into kyphosis after. And there's definitely literature to support that this does happen, that if a patient fails after a laminoplasty, a lot of times it's due to the fact that they had a pre-existing high T1 slope. And then this is a different topic for another day to talk about how we could better measure volumetric analysis of the posterior cervical musculature in some of these elderly patients. Uh, the next topic I'm going to bring up uh, with iatrogenic deformity is uh, DJK. Th this is something that's probably plagued me early on in my career more than PJK has, believe it or not. So uh, this was actually a case of mine that I had done my first year in practice, a patient that presented with cervical myelopathy, uh, you know, patting yourself on the back. This was probably one of my first cases when I was at SUNY Upstate in Syracuse. I performed the C3 to T1 decompression fusion. He did great from a myelopathic perspective. And then he walked back into my clinic about a year and a half or two years later with an x-ray saying, hey, Dr. G, I can't hold my head up anymore. So let's talk about DJK. DJK is the post-op loss of alignment in the distal spinal segments adjacent to the LIV or lower instrumented vertebrae. So what are some risk factors for DJK? Metabolic bone disease, higher number of posterior levels that are fused, higher degree of posterior osteotomies, such as doing a pedicle subtraction osteotomy or a VCR, use of transition rods, preoperative thoracic hyperkyphosis, lumbar hyperlordosis, or failure to address the secondary driver of deformity. And in my opinion, the three places that I've seen DJK take place are at the bone screw interface, compression deformities, either at the LIV or LIV plus one, or they can have distal ligamentous failure. And if it's your lucky day or unlucky day, some of these patients will actually have two or all three of these. So let's go over all of the deformity parameters here. His lordosis is way off here. The C2 slope is 46 degrees. C2 to 7 SVA is five centimeters. It should be less than four. Chin brow vertical angle should be a lot lower. It's 30 degrees currently. And his T1 slope is very high as well. When we look closely at his CAT scan, we can see that not only does he have DJK, he also has pseudarthrosis. He has haloing around his T1 screws. And now he's got ligamentous injury between T1 and T2. Why this happened, I'm not completely certain, but I can tell you that one of the risk factors for distal junction of kyphosis, at least in my own practice, is if you expose too low. So now I'm extraordinarily paranoid about keeping the upper instrumented ligamentous, uh, 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 muscular ligamentous complex completely intact uh, to prevent PJK. And we do the same for DJK as well. Again, so here's our interspinous gap that's increased. These are the parameters that we're shooting for. We want a C2 to 7 CSVA, less than four centimeters, C2 slope less than 20 degrees, chin brow vertical angle less than 25 degrees. And we want our mismatch between the T1 slope and two to seven lordosis to be less than 20 degrees. So how do we go about achieving that? One might consider an upper thoracic pedicle subtraction osteotomy, maybe multiple cervical thoracic PCLs, multi-level ACDF, which I think is probably the poorest option of all of these. So I'm going to show you how I went about correcting, uh, this was my case of distal junction of kyphosis. So here we are, we're opening up the skin. We're now exposing the posterior hardware, taking out the, uh, the previous screws and the set caps. We now need to consider if we're going to correct this, are we going to end at C3 or are we taking them up to C2? Anytime I do a deformity case, I'm always ending at at least C2. 
This is our freehand method of our pedicle screws at C2. We're placing a number one pen field. We're palpating the medial border uh, C2 pedicle. Here we are placing a translaminar screw on the right side. This is the tap. This is followed by the screw. And the reason we're doing the translaminar screw is that uh, we did not feel that the pedicle was conducive on the left, uh, I'm sorry, on the right side uh, for safe placement of a freehand pedicle screw. We take our intraoperative 3D uh, spin. And now what we're doing is performing our posterior column osteotomies. We use a combination of an ultrasonic bone cutting tool followed by a, uh, an osteotome. Anytime I do these cases, I do like to use a 5.5 cobalt chrome quad rod across the cervical thoracic junction. And now we're performing the deformity corrections we can see. And now we're fine tuning this with our in situ rod benders. Anytime I do a PCO or osteotomy, I do like to inject some fibrin glue in between uh, just so that we can layer bone graft on top of that. That was actually a trick I learned when I did a very uh, short observeship with, with Larry Lanky a number of years ago. Here's the uh, post-operative uh, x-ray that we could see C2 to 7 lower doses is now down to 33 degrees. C2 slope is down to 17 from 46. His C2 to 7 SVA is now less than four centimeters. Tin brow vertical angle is almost zero degrees. And the T1 slope has actually increased as well uh, from 66 down to 44 degrees. Going to go ahead and check the chat box to see if anyone has any questions. It looks like um, proposing a question about the same procedure can be done with the same similarity and minimally invasive or using robotic surgery. Um, I'm not sure what case you're referring to, but any of the cases I'm showing today, um, in my hands, they're best done as an open operation. Uh, I have not used the robot yet. I, I don't. I. I don't think I could find a lot of utility uh, for this magnitude of deformities that I've been showing. But the, for uh, your bread and butter degen cases, there, there's probably a role for it. All right. Um, so let's move on to the next case. This was probably uh, the hardest or one of the hardest cases I've ever done as an attending faculty. This was a gentleman in his mid fifties. Uh, he had presented to me with this scan. He has uh, significant hand wasting, weakness of his hand intrinsics, and he has a rigid chin on chest deformity, as we can see here. Um, he previously had had a trauma to his neck, had a front back operation, very unusual construct, had had multiple screws and rods from C1 all the way down to T6, thoracic 6. And we can see that the posterior superior part of T2 is now essentially impaling his spinal cord, uh, and this is likely responsible for some of the hand weakness, leg weakness uh, that he has. This is a very bizarre construct. I, I've never seen one like this before. He's got these uh, anterior uh, titanium mesh cages from C3 down to five. And then he has a separate cage essentially between at the bottom of C7 and the mid portion of C2. So obviously this is a problem. This is a bigger problem because now he's got a screw that's at the posterior superior part of uh, T2. And uh, to top things off, he's now auto-fused posteriorly here. If we're considering uh, a posterior fixation for this, um, typically I'd like to stop at C2 if we could. C2, obviously he's got no pedicles. We can't place translaminar screws. And par screws, we would get a very uh, flimsy screw in here, uh, probably about 10 millimeters in maximal length here. End of previous construct was at T6. He has a compression fracture at T9. And this is what his lumbar spine looks like, which is not particularly great. It was a previous paper that talked about the head suspension test. This is my patient. This is what his head looked like prior to the operation. So uh, we called our ENT colleagues and we said, is there anything that we could have you help us with? Maybe a manubriotomy. We called our thoracic surgeons. Nobody was entirely enthusiastic about going in through the front part of his neck or his chest here. So now uh, it was really up to us to figure out how we could correct his deformity from a posterior approach. So what we felt was that he essentially needed a three column osteotomy, right? He needed a pedicle subtraction osteotomy. And we also needed to figure out a way to cut all of this metal out from a posterior approach and keeping his spinal cord completely intact. So this needs to come out. This needs to come out. Uh, manubriotomy was out of the question, right? Here's his manubrium here. Uh, the patient did not want it. We would have had to crack this down uh, several centimeters to get uh, the proper vector to be able to perform an intercom resection here. This is what he looked like in surgery. This is why a lot of spine surgeons have neck problems because now we need to operate. This is obviously very poor ergonomics for us. He's now in the middle 
of the open Jackson frame here. So our goal was to perform a PSO here, cut this metal out, right? So how do we go about doing this? Um, here's a spinal cord, here's his nerve roots. We're able to take a coarse diamond drill bit. It's a little bit hard to see in this, uh, this video, um, but essentially what we would do is we would go through the metal. Most surgeons would use a metal cutting burr. I don't like to do that. Um, for a case like this, I actually used a, a six millimeter coarse diamond drill bit. We drilled through that screw through some of that titanium mesh cage. We were able to get a Woodson a PS. <clears throat> excuse me. Excuse me. A, a PSO impactor impact that dorsal wall of uh, what's left of T1 and T2 into what's left of that vertebral body. And then we left the remainder of that cage uh, intact. You can see this is uh, before we took it out. Uh, this is after we took it out. And now we're performing the deformity corrective maneuver here. We can see we uh, tightened this side. The contralateral side was left loose. We're now performing our compression maneuver on both sides. And we're able to uh, do some in situ rod bending as well and uh, get a very reasonable correction. And this is what things look like after we ended up taking him up to the occiput and uh, down to about a, a T10, I believe, is what we ended up taking him down to. We wanted to pass the distalmost area where he had had screws uh, because he had multiple uh, pedicle screws that had essentially eroded and had pulled out at some point. So we wanted to upsize all of those past there. This is what his post-op CT scan looks like afterwards. Um, this is what his intraoperative photo looked like. We can see his head's no longer through the Jackson frame here. I don't use anything fancy. Uh, I know a lot of surgeons will, will use bivector traction. I haven't really gotten into that. At UNC, we now have this Laveau head holder. I have not tried that for a, a case of this magnitude. I have done it before, though. For this case, um, we just use kind of a run-of-the-mill Mayfield uh, during the operation, uh, tending surgeon scrubs out. We have our junior resident. Uh, keep their eye on the spinal cord. We essentially just translate the head posteriorly. We're able to get a pretty reasonable result here. We can see this is what his intraoperative photo looked like after we performed our deformity correction. I have to give a shout out to Dr. Bajes, a previous fellow, Jose Orende. We're in the process of publishing this case. Uh, he is uh, not only a, a world-class soon-to-be neurosurgeon, but he's also a world-class medical artist or a specifically a neurosurgical artist. This is his artistic rendition of the work that we did here of us using the coarse diamond drill bit, operating around the spinal cord, the exiting nerve root, and essentially drilling out that cage. Um, and uh, hopefully this is on the cover of the neurosurgical uh, journal at some point in the future. Uh, but really interesting case, very challenging case. It's something like this, for those wondering, took me about 15 hours to do. Luckily, we were able to keep his spinal cord completely intact. And after surgery, uh, he was actually pretty satisfied with, with his head position. Still a lot more work to do in his thoracic and lumbar spine at some point down the road if he ever wants it. Um, but I think we were able to adequately address his cervical spine here. Um, let's see how much time we have left. Looks like we've got about 15 minutes or so left. So I thought we'll talk about some neuromuscular cases. Uh, Mike, any comments, questions on that last case or, or chat box? Yeah, so a um, couple of chat box uh, uh, points. Um, uh, one about, you know, can you do this minimally invasively or with robotic surgery uh, from Dr. Soto? And, and Dr. Burchak is saying, is the distal fixation far enough? So as far as robotic, I, I had uh, mentioned that before. For, for these types of cases, you know, I personally, I've never used robotics outside of a cadaveric lab. Um, you know, I, I I just haven't before. So for this magnitude of deformity in my hands, I probably would, would not try to use technology that I wasn't comfortable with. As far as, you know, placing some of these pedicle screws with robotics, sure. Uh, I, I don't think that's unreasonable to do something like that. As far as how low down to take this gentleman, unfortunately, this, this x-ray is cut off here. Um, we ended up taking him down to T10. So you might ask why T10. I see if I can pull up his uh, his preoperative his preoperative scan here. Um, so here we are. It's hard to to see, but he actually had fixation all the way down to T6. I don't have access to them now because I'm in uh, UNC. This case was a, a one I had done in New York, um, but his the apex of his kyphosis was around the T6 T7 area based on the upright x-rays. I don't usually base it off of the supine CT. I base it off, off of the upright scoliosis x-rays. 
And um, I was not keen on stopping at T8 because he had a fracture at T9. So we ended up taking him down to T10. Um, that being said, his lumbar spine was a complete disaster too. And at some point down the road, he's probably going to need to have that fixed. I yeah, hope that leave the rods home. Um, I, um, the question from Kelly Chamberlain, Michael, um, how do you determine if the chin on chest deformity is rigid versus flexible? And how do you know if it will translate intra op Sorry, I think I was just muted. So uh, the best way is really to just examine the patient, right? We bring them into clinic. Uh, any patient I suspect has a cervical deformity or cervical thoracic deformity, I have them lay down on the bed and I say, try to put your head back. Well, this guy, this is intra-op, but before surgery, we did the same thing. He couldn't lean his head back, right? So that tells me that this is a rigid deformity. The other way is that we look at the CAT scan. We see if there's bridging bone posteriorly. That's another way. Um, you know, just looking at their preoperative MRI scan or CAT scan, those are all supine studies. So we're able to get an indication as to whether or not that deformity reduces uh, when they're in a supine position. So, so that's really, those are really the three metrics that I use to uh, utilize whether or not this is uh, flexible or not. So let's uh, move Matt on. Matt Burchak's asking, Mike, yeah. how is a coarse diamond burr different from a regular diamond burr or a regular cutting burr? So That's the, a good question. Yeah, so the coarse diamond burr has um, has different gradations of, of speculations on them. So there's the smooth diamond, which I never use. Uh, you know, a lot of my coarse diamonds end up becoming a smooth diamond by the time I'm done with them. And sometimes I'll go through several throughout a, a big case like this. Um, and then we have a coarse diamond that has multiple speculations. And then there's something I use a lot. It's called an extra coarse diamond that has even more speculations. So essentially, it just goes from less aggressive to more aggressive. Um, I do like using the diamond drill because uh, it heats up bone. Uh, so it coagulates the bone. With that case I showed previously of the infection, it, you could kind of buff up the end plate. You know, it, it doesn't really chatter through bone as well and cause a lot of bleeding. Um, so th that's really my indications for using these drills. As far as getting through metal, I was surprised it worked for that case, but it actually worked uh, remarkably well. There was something about using a metal cutting bird millimeters away from the spinal cord that kind of irked me. So I, I kind of went to my comfort zone, which was the uh, the six millimeter coarse diamond. This, this was a, a very fascinating case that I did when I used to work at the Veterans Hospital in New York a number of years ago. This was a gentleman that about five or eight years before I had met him, he had had a T10 to S1 uh, fusion, completely rock solid fusion here. He presented to me with a chin on chest deformity. Here's what his pre-op CAT scan looked like. If you look at this in isolation, it looks like that he's got pretty good cervical lordosis here. Um, so he really has two deformities in my opinion. He's got cervical deformity, and then he also has a cervical thoracic deformity. This is what he looked like when he showed up the clinic. Essentially has 90 degrees of kyphosis. Uh, I tried very hard with my hands to push his head back gently. This, this was completely rigid, okay? Um, this is a case of what's called dropped head syndrome. And this is really secondary to a variety of etiologies. Uh, myopathy, it affects the neck extensors. You could have myasthenia gravis patients that have this polymyositis, CADP, metabolic myopathy. There, there's a whole variety of etiologies for dropped head syndrome. Um, you know, and during some of these surgeries, we'll actually end up taking a small muscle biopsy. So this was this gentleman, what he looked like before surgery. And we could see uh, that, you know, he did correct pretty nicely with a little bit of rock heronium, which I was very happy about. So our anesthesiology colleagues helped us out profoundly with this operation, um, but he still has a cervical thoracic deformity. So we felt um, that we could go one of two ways with this. Um, you know, we, we could go through the front of the neck, try to give some, some, uh, robust fixation and then do a poster operation, or we could take this and do an extension of fusion from his previous thoracolumbar construct and take him all the way up to C2. So the way that we correct the cervical thoracic deformities, uh, I try to keep patients away from pedicle subtraction osteotomies. Like the last case I showed you, uh, I think most of these deformities can be fixed and addressed adequately with, with these. Uh, okay, th this is what a ponte or posterior column osteotomy is or chevron osteotomy. The way I do these is that I'll take an ultrasonic bone cutting tool. We make our L-cut through the inferior articulating process. 
we take our quarter inch straight osteotome, we take the IAPs out, we take down the inferior spinous process, drill through the inferior lamina, we then find the ligamentum flavum, take out the SAP, and then again, we perform our compression maneuver here. And this is a very, very long construct, as you can see, there's probably about six or seven rods in this guy. I don't like putting clonal bends on rods. That's something I learned from Larry Lanky a number of years ago. So I have no problem placing multiple straight rods. I try to avoid uh, coronal bends into rods if we can help it. Um, the downside of doing this, obviously, is that you have a lot of metal that's covering your bone surface area. So you do have to decorticate very well before you drop all of your rods and final tighten everything. And um, this was what we had uh, completed afterwards. Um, we took him from C2 essentially down to S1. I think at the end of these operations, it is important that the back of the head is in line with the posterior apex of the thoracic spine. If you've achieved that, these patients are going to be relatively happy after surgery. Again, another secondary marker that I've achieved my goals is that now he can lay down on the bed without a pillow supporting him. And then this is what he looked like afterwards. I think one can make the argument that maybe we should have done some lumbar work here to see if we could kick him back more to get the back of his occiput in line with his thoracic apex. But at the end of the day, uh, this gentleman really did not want any more spine surgery. And I think that this was a very reasonable functional result for this gentleman. As we can see, he's now got a relatively horizontal gaze. He's about two and a half or three years uh, out of surgery and has done extraordinarily well. He actually did run into a small bout of dysphagia for a few months. He's now able to eat fine. Uh, but just interestingly, his esophagus was, was so accustomed to being in this hyperkyphotic manner that when we straightened him out, despite the fact that we did not go through the anterior part of his neck, he still did develop some uh, post-operative dysphagia, which again has uh, completely resolved after surgery. It's going to check the chat box again. Um, looks like no new questions. This was another very fascinating case that we did uh, probably about a month, month and a half or so ago of a functional. This was kind of an oncologic slash functional case. This was a gentleman in his early 50s that uh, had a diagnosis, actually had an un, uh, was undiagnosed, had presented to our clinic with a chin on chest deformity, but also with very severe cervical myelopathy. We can see that he's got multiple metastatic deposits. His spinal cord is severely compressed. And one of the surprising features here is the, despite the fact that he has no pathologic fractures, his uh, preoperative x-ray looked like this. So again, he's got about a 90 degree or almost 90 degree curve. He could not hold his head up if his life depended on it. So you might be wondering why is somebody without fractures have this deformity that's really rapidly progressed over the course of a few months. And I don't have a video for this case. This was just done a few weeks or so ago. Um, but interestingly, this more than likely was a case of paraneoplastic syndrome. As we all remember from the medical school days, patients that have small cell lung cancer are prone to these paraneoplastic syndromes. Um, this is called myasthenic Lambert syndrome. Is at least this is what the, the kind of the running diagnosis was. And we ended up doing an occipital uh, to thoracic fusion on him. You may ask, why did we take him up to the occiput? Uh, C1 and C2 was chock full of tumor and had very poor fixation. So we ended up skipping C1 and took him up to the occiput. Very fascinating case, though, of a functional deformity where a patient developed a paraneoplastic syndrome. At least this is what the running diagnosis was. Uh, he's still currently in the hospital, but we were able to uh, decompress the spinal cord adequately and also correct his chin on chest deformity, as you can see here. The last topic that I'll bring up in the last uh, five to 10 minutes is degenerative spine deformity. And there's, there's one type of deformity that I'm going to bring up here. I won't touch upon all of these. It's the rigid cervical deformities. And I know we've talked about a few of these already. Um, this is the degenerative variant of rigid cervical deformities. So um, something interesting I've noticed over the years uh, in my practice is that a lot of these cases that have circumferential rigidity, um, you know, in my training, we would treat these a lot with uh, 540 operations. When I was a fellow, we would do these back front back operations. There, there's a lot of literature that supports doing these. So what's a 540? You take a patient to surgery, we would place all of their screws, we perform posterior calm osteotomies on them take them, do our anterior column osteotomies, multi-level ACDF or corpectomy, then take the patient back for a third stage and then fixate them. This was a case I did when I was at Brown a number of years ago, chin on chest deformity. We did our posterior releases, ACDFs, posterior fixation. 
beautiful construct. The patient did really well, but I guess the question is, you know, does the patient really need three different operations or can we take care of this with anterior only osteotomies uh, followed by posterior fixation infusion and taking them just for a 360 as opposed to a 540. So I'm going to propose, and I think we all know this, anterior osteotomies work, right? We know this from the ankylosing spondylitis uh, population. Some of these patients have no uh, posterior element fractures, but yet we, quote unquote, uh, they can correct themselves with an anterior only osteotomy. And the, case, uh, the question is, can we do this in a safe fashion? So I'm going to talk about three cases here where we only address the anterior uh, fusion that they had had, and we're able to get a, a very nice uh, clinical correction and radiographic correction. This was a patient, uh, 62 years old, who presented with progressive loss of dexterity, falls, chin on chest deformity. I, sh I shouldn't say it's quite a chin on chest, but she has difficulty maintaining upright uh, erect gaze or horizontal gaze, if you will. And what we can see here is that she's got severe static compression, kyphotic deformity of the upper cervical spine. It appears that she's got a rigid um, C3 and C4, anteriorly, posteriorly is rigid, and she also has a chronic fracture at C2 as well. So our proposal here was to take out the C4 vertebral body. We wanted to perform an anterior column osteotomy. The struggle that we had was how will we place a cage between the end plate of C3 uh, inferiorly and the superior end plate of C5. So we decided uh, to perform a grade three osteotomy here, which is the vertebral column resection. These patients I usually take uh, for preoperative traction, I'm sorry, intraoperative traction. I usually don't do preoperative traction on these patients. We give them neuromuscular blockade. We get them stretched out. And you have to understand that the posterior fusion that they have will not change one bit when you place them in traction. What you're hoping for is that they have mobile joints above and below, and you can utilize these during surgery uh, to help get them corrected. So this is a quick video of what we did. We placed our cast bar pins in C3, cast bar pin in C5. We're now drilling through that C4 vertebral body, once again, getting underneath the posterior longitudinal ligament, as we can see. We now take an intraoperative x-ray. We realize that there's still a fairly large fragment of bone that we have to take down. So we use uh, intraoperative fluoroscopy to guide us. We take our coarse diamond drill bit. And again, what we're doing here with that with that diamond drill is that we're, we're kind of reinventing her inferior end plate of C3. We're able to make it nice and flush. We buff it down. It doesn't bleed. We're able to place our expandable cage and now I do like to top off some of these constructs with the C23 ACDF as well, uh, just to uh, help for arthrodesis purposes and also to help uh, regain what they've lost with their C2 slope. And we're able to get a very nice clinical and radiographic result here. We can see that we've improved her C2 slope. We've taken her out of kyphosis. And most importantly, we've decompressed her spinal cord. This is what she looked like before surgery. And this is what she looked like after surgery. Um, I do have a few other cases. I do have a couple of other cases or so, but it looks like it's about seven o'clock. So I'm going to end there and see if uh, any of the other panelists have questions, comments, or if anyone in the chat box wants to uh, to reach out to ask me anything at this stage. All right. Well, it looks like no one else has any questions. Uh, I, I don't know what's on tap for next week, but if you guys stay in tune with LinkedIn and Twitter. I'm sure Dr. Baj will be posting next week um, who's going to be speaking. So I hope all of you guys enjoyed that. I hope uh, someone learned something. I do suspect that this will probably be up on uh, YouTube in a few days if anyone missed any of this. And um, I think all of you have my Twitter handle, LinkedIn account. Reach out to me if anyone has any questions or comments um, about any of these cases. Um, feel free to reach out. All right, guys. Have a wonderful night. <clears throat>